Welcome everyone to today's talk on plastics, a tale a century old. My name is Lauren Dujambri and I'm, in the, I'm the Assistant Dean of College Relations and Development here at the College of Chemistry at UC Berkeley. And it's my great pleasure to introduce today's talk. Today's talk is part of Berkeley Ecosystems, a new initiative where you can learn, explore and connect with Berkeley faculty, alumni, students and industry innovators on relevant topics. Now for a few logistical matters regarding today's discussion. Today's panel discussion is going to be recorded as we're all past events. You can uh, explore all of our recordings at Berkeley Ecosystems at ecosystems.berkeley.edu. We're planning to field uh, questions at the end of today's discussion. So please use your Q&A function as opposed to the chat function to share any thoughts or pose any questions to our, to our speaker. And finally, directly following our event today, we'll receive a short survey. Please take a moment to provide us feedback on today's discussion and on future topics. And now it is my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Ting Zhu. Professor Zhu re received her BS from Dalian University of Technology and MS from the Changshan Institute of Applied Chemistry at the Chinese Academy of Sciences before obtaining her PhD from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Professor Zhu served as a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania and Cold Neutron for Biology and Technology at NIST before joining the faculty here at Berkeley as an assistant professor in 2007. Professor Zhu's research has been recognized with numerous awards, including by DuPont, 3M, and the American Chemical Society. Professor Zhu's research focuses on polymers, biomaterials, and materials chemistry to generate nanostructured materials with built-in biological, electrical, and magnetic functionalities, including biodegradability. Professor Zhu is now a professor in chemistry and professor in material science and engineering here at UC Berkeley. Please join me in thank you, Professor Ting Zhu for speaking to us today. And I'll hand it over to you, uh, Ting. All right, thank you so much. That was uh, a very flattering introduction. Uh, thank you so much. Let's just go ahead and get started. All right. Um, so let's just go ahead and start. Polymer is uh, fairly new, if not the youngest in the field of chemistry. Um, you know, a little bit over a hundred years ago, um, Staudinger actually hypothesized micromolecule existence and basically proposed that we can synthesize them and they can generate beautiful materials. But back then there's a lot of, there has been a lot of resistance. People don't believe micromolecules um, available and this is just one of the advice and that was a given to him and people think that most of them are small molecules more like with less than five cells and obviously that was not right um, and then when I teach polymers where I love to use uh, these three photos here this is from Dupont and if some of you uh, can notice here this happened to be a picture of Macy's outside of Market Street. And that was the day that nylon and penthouse was on sale. Looking for, uh, going forward, you can see here just a table from the textbook showing that uh, different classes of polymers has been generated since then. And I would say fast forward, plastic completely changed the way how we live. So, Back 2020, there's nearly 400 million um, tons of material being produced. And certainly they bring a lot of convenience and made a lot of things uh, possible. Uh, if you look at uh, um, United Dreamliner um, as airplane, the wings are uh, going to be changed to carbon nanotube based composite to make the flight to be much more fuel efficient and can fly longer. But on the other end, how we have been designing plastic is really in a linear fashion. We make them, we optimize them for the best property we can get. And sustainability really wasn't a design parameter. And if you look into in terms of the material uh, usage at the end of the life, what do you see is that for plastic, over 30% get into packaging. And if you count plastic coupled with a textile, that's about 50%. Many of those materials are not used for a long time, and they end up, in particular for packaging, um, some of them may have a lifetime of six months, and then afterwards they get discarded. And a lot of them has a very high surface volume ratio. That means that they can be easily uh, break it down into small pieces 
Um, that's if you see a lot of the news related to microplastic. And there's a very little uh, financial incentive for people to collect them and recycle them just because the sheer amount of material you have in there. Packaging also have additional challenge because in order to reduce, to increase the property, for example, barrier or mechanical property, many of them compose a different variety of, uh, different variety of polymers. We can talk about that um, later. So obviously the plastic problem um, is imminent, it has to be resolved. We have to really change the way how we design plastic from the get-go. And on the other hand, we also have to deal with the plastic that's piled up right now. So um, from a different uh, uh, you know, nonprofit organization, people have done studies and there are a numerous call out to, to community in trying to change consumer behavior, trying to get into the manufacturer to change um, the way how they produce plastic at get go. And there are also a lot of movement at the customer end. So here are just a few things I wanted to share with you. And many of the large uh, brands are making, they already made the pledge in order to reduce um, the footprint for the plastic waste. So I'm going to focus on biodegradable plastic for the moment because uh, for the packaging of single use plastic, it really makes sense. It by no means that they should be viewed as a whole field of plastic industry. There's a lot of other plastic, um, you know, it's not going to be covered here. And many of them should not even made to be biodegradable in my opinion, because the purpose, because the existing recycle infrastructure for them. So in any case, for the biodegradable plastic, what they are really nothing new. They have been studied extensively in biology. So for example, if you go into doctor's office, you have a surgery, you can use biodegradable sutures and you don't need to go back, they just dissolve. They have been optimized working really well under the biological condition where the enzymatic um, or the different uh, living organism can easily uh, digest them, and convert them into small molecules. But this does not appear to be the case uh, as we learned but in any case, years ago, when the biodegradable plastic was first proposed, the thoughts are things they have the um, chemical bond can be readily accessed by the biological component that has been evolved in nature has been used. It should be um, the most benign approach to go. And in fact, the global market has increased drastically. And right now it's about $3.8 billion. Um, it's going to pro um, project it to increase substantially. For US alone, you can see here is um, uh, the market demand as a function of years, as well as the type of materials. Starch obviously has a substantial um, market share. And you know from the uh, long-term um, equity point of view, it's a still remain controversial um, whether starch should be used for plastic while well, people are starving. But in any case, after biodegradable plastic had really high hope from the community, um, it's really sad for people to realize that it really doesn't fulfill its uh, promise. And there has been um, discussions from the policymakers if we should revert back to the polyolefin based material, or you know, if biodegradable plastic will ever fulfill its promise to the community. So um, starting from 2019 to 2002, um, work with one of the local startup in tropic material funded by NSF ICOR. We did about 200 interviews with different stakeholders to really understand what are the problem in the biodegradable plastic. So on one end, it was really great to hear that people are really excited about and people are very um, passionate about uh, having a green um, environment and really to leave the world as clean, as fresh as we could for generations to come. In particular for the millennium, they are, they are willing to pay a little bit extra uh, so that they can have a better place to live. But on the other end, there are issues from the uh, waste management infrastructure. For example, for the industrial compost, 
all the things that is considered compostable has been in and out in about 60 days under the condition they have. But the plastic, at least right now, need about a half year. And in many cases, the microplastic can linger around for two or three years or even longer. So basically, we were told on blank that uh, many of the bags that was labeled as biodegradable, they see absolutely no difference from the polyolefin type of plastic. The other thing what come down to is that uh, if it just doesn't degrade, they had to sort it out. Because for example, PLA, uh, even though it sounds really good because it's not degrading completely, it still have debris and it can become a contamination for the downstream uh, recycling. For example, for polyolefins, the recycling line is pretty well established. So I can downgrade the material going from a food grade to um, maybe get molded into a chair, and then the chair can subsequently get in part of the cement, et cetera. But if you have PLA in there, you really uh, compromise the material and then act as contamination. So it's really disheartening for us to hear. Some people just tell us out blank that I'm not doing this anymore. We take the cost cut, we take the cost cut, and you guys are not delivering what you have. So I'm going back to recycle, forget about this biodegradable business. So we need to go back to really think about it as a scientist as well, engineer, what we can do, because we really believe biodegradable is the way to go. It's one of the process that we can run a viable path. We can really have a, this is a circle going from a small molecule, even go back to the you know, photosynthesis from the CO2, uh, water, et cetera, and then making material useful and subsequently return it back to Earth. But Scientifically, there's really a lot of challenges because it's not about just you make it degradable. You do have many, many different uh, boundary conditions. Let me just share with you. This is along this uh, a value chain. Uh, every step has to be considered when you first design your material um, to achieve this circular, life, um, this circular life cycle. First of all, we have to really decide what type of catalyst we wanted to use. And uh, the catalyst, has to be um, environmental friendly. And from the manufacturer point of view, they have to be uh, cost affordable. And then from the consumer point of view, they cannot compromise the host property. And the, from the large scalable, scalable manufacturing point of view, uh, no one is going to change the existing infrastructure for the plastic manufacturing. Uh, from the end user point of view, they also want to make sure that it is compatible with existing uh, supply chains, the storage and the product lifetime, but yet at the end of the time, at the end of the usage, they need to be de uh, degraded on demand. From the waste management point of view, they basically put in, they are not going to change the um, composting condition, which is oftentimes at 40 to 60 degrees. Sometimes it can go a little bit higher. And the cycle they have, they have to maintain somewhere about 60 days in order to be profitable. It cannot be longer. And then from the eco ecological point of view, they wanted to have a material definitely will not introduce a secondary contamination, even the trace amount of them and that they have to be vetted so that we are not going to create another problem by solving this problem. And along the process, uh, there are public policy makers we need to discuss, but uh, uh, even though um, people talk about they are going to change their uh, behavior as consumers, the reality is it most likely is going to stay. So you have to really design your system, manufacture it to really tailor to the consumers. So this turned out to be a wonderful um, platform for us to do science and for us to really understand how to carry out the reaction with all the different boundary conditions, not in liquid, not in solution, but rather in the viscoelastic uh, melt, as well as in the hierarchical structures. So over 70% of plastic turn out to be a semi-crystalline polymers. That means that they form hierarchical structures across different land scales. At the molecular level, at the monomer level, they pack into a unicell, typical unicell with a dimension of few angstrom. And then the polymer chain act as a stem. The stem fold back and forth and they form lamellis. And the lamellis essentially is highly anisotropic thin sheets, typically um, you know, 10 to 15 nanometer in thickness, and they can grow in the range of microns or so tens of microns. 
in implant. And then they subsequently pack into a sphere light. This is where you have a wax, you dry that you're going to see this beautiful sphere light like a snowflake coming out. So with this hard article structure and you compare the lens skill to the catalyst you're going to use, whether you use, want to use a small molecule catalyst, a micromolecule catalyst, in this case, we decide to go with enzyme just because uh, enzyme can be readily deactivated and it's something that has been vetted by our environment. So we want to really minimize eco long-term ecological impact. So if you have a um, catalytically active enzyme embedded in the plastic, there's different ways. And in particular, in this case, the lens skill become important. For any given polymer chain, so if we're looking to the polymer chain at the individual, at the single chain level, the dimension typically in the range of few nanometers or tens of nanometers. So this is also the similar size range of your enzymes. So in order for you to disperse enzyme to have access to the polymer chain, they have to disperse in the nanoscopic level. So you are basically looking at the reaction under nano confinement. And if you have that, and if you look into the single polymer chain conformation, this will really open up a huge playground for you to manipulate how the reaction is going to happen, what the kinetics, what is the pathway, and as well as what is your end product. Let me just give you a very quick schematic over. So if you have an enzyme that is just covering on the surface of the plastic, which is oftentimes happen if you discard a piece of plastic and they end up in the water. So the enzyme can only access from the surface and you're going through a surface erosion process. In that case, the enzyme can flow around and they can bind to the substrate, which in this case happened to be a micromolecule in the many way so that uh, um, you know, whatever available, it's going to chew up. It's going to be a very slow process. But on the other end, if you confine your enzyme, in particular, uh, if you can do a nanoscopic dispersion of your enzyme, you really open up a lot of opportunities. For example, the enzyme will only go into the amorphous domain. So this is what you have here. In the amorphous domain, polymer chains are not crystalline. So they oftentimes have a mobility and they are randomly arranged just like a spaghetti noodle in the bowl. But what you also see is that the enzyme, in this case, they are in the viscoelastic melt. It doesn't really have a lot of freedom to floating around. And it pretty much have to take whatever they have around, uh, you know, polymer chains around. So you become a kinetically controlled reaction such that only when the enzyme can get to the substrate, it's going, the reaction is going to happen. So it's a substrate diffusion limited process. And also because the enzyme happened to be in the amorphous domain, that's where the polymer chain end can be. So open up opportunity for you to have a processive depolymerization from the chain end. You basically eat it at the chain end rather than random, like this, um, random chain session. The random chain session can break it down into small pieces and it really accelerate the formation of microplastic. It doesn't really eliminate microplastic, but processive depolymerization does. So I'm going to tell you uh, briefly three different areas we do um, to really understand the fundamental, um, how can we manipulate the reaction at the molecular level? And how can we um, satisfy the boundary condition I mentioned to you by really understanding the reaction happening under the nano confinement? The first thing is we have to disperse enzyme. Uh, inside of the plastic in the nanoscopic level. And that turned out to be non-trivial because you really have to maintain um, the enzyme to be active while enhanced compatibility. And this turned out to be, um, we, we have a field advantage um, because my group uh, developed a technology and um, back 2018 that we basically have this little uh, plastic wrapper, wrap around the, the enzyme and allow us to maintain the activity and their non-native environment. So if you look into what that enzyme, what that wrapper is, we purposely go with uh, methylmethacrylate-based materials. And the methacrylate-based material is chosen because it's UV degradable. 
and then uh, once it degraded, it also um, can get into a fairly small molecule has minimal impact. So it's not going to be left behind. So once you have that, you can really disperse your enzyme inside of your plastic fairly well. So this is uh, the green where the enzyme is tagged and you can see that it's a fairly uniform dispersed. But the most important part is that when you overlay it with polarized optical microscope, they basically you see the sphere light, and that's where the crystal, crystalline domain, you also see the amorphous region. So the enzyme are existing um, pretty homogeneous across rather than just in a particular area. We want it to be homogeneous access because we really don't want to have a, a microplastic that can linger around. And if you look at the transmission electron microscope, you can see there are enzymes or clusters. We believe there are smaller enzyme clusters inside the, uh, the morphous region that we not be able to see with TN. And from the engineering point of view, adding the enzyme really cannot compromise it, particular, the host polymer properties. And in this case, we'll particularly focus on the mechanical property. And that appears to be the case because we are really only add a very small amount of, so in this case, the enzyme is only like 2% by weight. And that is almost the same as what you can to have for other additives or for dyes, et cetera. And we can add this uh, as a, just the ingredient, like you add the color pigment in when you go through this um, extrusion process. And this is just basically showing that we can get this and go through a, a single head extruder and get into, a, into a, a, a wire. And then subsequently, you can see the wire can be degraded. And this happened to be a piece of uh, plastic sheets that we basically just put into a buffer and monitor to see it disappearing over time. And what is important for us in this case is really those microplastics. We basically take them out and then step them under the optical microscope to see how the microplastic degrade. And you can see that under the optical microscope, um, the plastic is forming this porous network. So it's really start to degrade from inside out rather than from the external um, surface erosion. And then also the microplastics started getting smaller and smaller. So um, we have to extend this to see if this can go beyond just a test tube inside of uh, plastic, because when you degrade it, you eventually are going to release the enzyme. So you have a multiple process going on. You don't want that to mislead what happened at the material under the composting um, condition. So this is exactly what we did. This is one is a PCL, another is polylactic acid. Those are two commonly used biodegradable plastics. And we basically embed inside them there and then we embed it and we just put them into the dirt um, to see it. And the PCL degrade a little bit faster than PLA. PLA take, uh, um, you know, I would say this is after six days at 50 degrees. It takes about a few weeks for us to uh, no longer to find it, but uh, it, it, it's, um, and, you know, both of them are degrading. And we also want to see um, what happened to the microplastic after the plastic in, get disintegrated. Um, as long as you get the material to degrade, you cannot avoid a microplastic formation unfortunately. So the key is make sure that the microplastic can continue the degradation process. And this, in this case, what you see is that one, even though the microplastic still form inside, there's still in, uh, enzyme embedded, and that explains why we can get a near complete degradation. And at a nanoscopic level, here is uh, SEM pictures of uh, internal uh, structure of degraded plastic uh, in the middle of degradation. You can see there's a lot of pores. And this is, again give us the confidence that the enzyme indeed is nanoscopically dispersed. And this is also consistent with when we're looking to the small X-ray scattering, look at the crystal structures. So uh, it's not just like in the eye, you see the plastic disappearing. It's really important to see that they were going to continue degrade, continue the process. So now the second question we wanted to answer is that, uh, are we just degrading them into uh, different polymers? Um, 
for that is small or even microplastic, much smaller than what we have. Uh, so we generate nanoparticles or we really convert them back into a small molecule. It is very important to convert them back to the small molecule. For one, if you want to do a circular, you, want, you, know, you can collect the, the monomers and then repolymerize it. The other is really trying to eliminate any potential generation of nanoparticle, since we really don't know how the nanoparticle of plastic is going to affect our health. So this is a getting into a little bit more on the molecular level, what we can do in order to modulate the degradation pathway for the system to uh, really going through a polymer to monomer conversion with near complete, near you know, over 90% of conversion. So there are a couple of things. One is really, we look at the binding pocket of the enzyme. So the active site can be either surface exposed or it can have a very deep pocket. We hypothesize that when it's a surface exposed, the enzyme can bind into the middle of the polymer chain. But when it has a really deep pocket, we are taking advantage of the mobility at the polymer chain end, as well as the conformation flexibility, so that the chain end can get into the deep pocket. While if you're in the middle of the polymer chain, the chain has to bend um, pretty tightly in order to fit into the space. So the catalytic active site uh, conformation uh, geometry give us an option to either select the chain end or to dock onto the middle of the polymer chain. And the deep pocket is clear is something that we prefer. Um, because we really, once we know it's a chain end to get into it, the degradation will proceed with the depolymerization from chain end rather than the random chain session in the middle of it. So this is just a two GPC graph tell, you know, confirm the mechanism we see. Once we have this deep pocket enzyme uh, embedded into the plastic, and you know, it, it's really wonderful to see the hypothesis worked. So from the GPC, you can see that uh, um, as we increase uh, the degradation time, we don't see a reduction in the residue polymer molecular weight. This is give us the confidence that we're not doing random transaction. And then you can see when we have um, another polymer in solution, this, uh, so anyway, so that's the GPC. And then we also want to look into the crystallinity evolution. This is a, uh, when you bind to the chain end, you can imagine that it should be fairly straightforward to degrade amorphous region because the polymer chain has mobility so they can slide through uh, that pocket. So what about the, the part that is in the crystalline domain? So a lot of times the reason we end up getting the microplastic is because the polymers in the crystalline domain are not accessible. So they are held together by forming the crystal. So the enzyme really cannot get into it. So in this case, we just get really lucky. It turned out that the, the enzyme was able to pull the polymer chain out of the crystalline domain because once they hang onto the chain end, they keep chewing it. Like, you know, you have a spaghetti noodle, you just take the end until you finish that spaghetti and you jump into the next chain. And when we're looking to the crystalline, crystallinity evolution, that's exactly what we see. So we basically do not, as the process of degradation proceed, we don't really see the crystallinity change. That means that both the crystalline domain as well as amorphous domain are being degraded. And that is important because otherwise you're going to leave the highly crystalline domain behind. When we also start to look into the small molecule, uh, look at the degradation by product, and this is where we did LCMS, and the blue corresponding to this uh, um, deep pocket embedded, um, embedded in deep embedded enzyme inside of the plastic. And, you know, it's not like we get all the monomers, we also get dimer and trimer, but they are all small molecules, and they can be either um, degraded or metabolized by the uh, microbes nearby in the compost facility, or you can collect them. And in fact, we collected the degradation product and repolymerize it. And uh, you know, the process can be recycled several times. It really uh, closed the loop for the plastic. That all seems good till one day we realized that the 
polymer matrix morphology is very sensitive to addition of additives. And additives is not avoidable when you start to think about uh, um, the plastic manufacturing. There's not even a single, single product out there is made of one type of polymer. There are always additive, there's always other components. And the addition of the blend or uh, additives will change how the polymer crystallizes. And in this case, we purposely induce the additives. We want to change morphology into the host matrix to see how that is going to affect the degradation as well to extent of degradation. And this is, uh, you can see this is a TM. This is polarized optical microscope. So we just add a little bit additive into the system. You can see that in this case, the lamellic sheets are fairly straight. They are very flat. But as we're adding additives, the additive has to be excluded out from the crystalline domain and that induce the bending of the lamellae. And naturally that is going to trickle down how the polymer chain is going to get packed. So indeed a, a small amount of additive into the system, only you know, one or 2% can lead to a significant change in the level of degradation. So we have, uh, you know, a system that we can get nearly um, uh, over 95% degradation, polymer to small molecule conversion. But as we're adding the additive, exactly the same system, just a little bit of additive in there, you can see they start at 50% and they are now going to degrade further. So we only leave uh, this uh, microplastic behind. And we try to reset the summer history and trying to see if we can get the system to do a little bit. Um, the system can be reset. We can gain another 10% addition of degradation, but we can never achieve near, um, uh, near complete um, degradation. So this is a, let us go back to see what happened. And we attribute it to the additive. It turned out we are correct because as we add additive, our crystallization change. So the system crystallizes much faster because nucleation of the crystallization change. And, but we are now changing the lamella structure. So at the, the um, monomer level, how the system are going to pack as well as at the lamella thickness, how the polymer chain is going to fold them back and forth to form the lamella structure is not changing. The only thing we change is the curvature. So this is where we basically go back, look at the image analysis, we'll look at the curvature. So what does the curvature change? So if you go back and look at the, the just very simple lattice model of the lamella and you want to pack how your polymer chain is going to arrange. It turned out that if you go from a flat lamella to a highly curved lamella, you are going to change the accessibility or the special distribution of your polymer chain end. So the polymer chain end is readily sequestered at the interface because it's the best way to release the cross-sectional mismatch to release that curvature, to stabilize that curvature. And once the polymer chain end is sandwiched at this interface, it's not uh, uh, accessible by the enzyme anymore. So um, the enzyme is going to grab onto the chain end that's available and then finish it. And then it cannot find another chain end available to grab onto. And basically that's how the degradation end up stop. And this is a consistent with what we see at solid state NMR. We're basically using that to probe the dynamic of the polymer chain end. And you can see as we increased the um, additives, um, you know, the amorphous region become much more rigid. So what can you do? This is what we see that we know that we have another enzyme with a surface exposed um, active site and that can easily cleave out the chain in the middle through the random chain session. And as it cleave the polymer chain, it's going to act, uh, produce the chain end um, with, that is far away from the interface. And that could be ready to access by the enzyme. And that turned out to work out really well. So basically exactly the same set sample that uh, we can only degrade to about maybe like 50%. We add a tiny bit of the enzyme in there and the reaction proceed and we can get into over 90% of completion of the degradation. And then as you can see that uh, when we uh, change the amount of that uh, um, 
enzymes, we start to change uh, how fast the chain end can be, and as well as how often the new chain end can be created. And it's worthwhile to point it out that this chain created chain end process is appear to be a, a second stage, not in the first. This is also consistent with our hypothesis that the polymer grab into the available chain end first, and then once they finish those polymer chains, they get into the new chain end. All right, so I'm going to spend the last uh, maybe five minutes to talk about the latency and the programmability. So this is important um, in order for us to make it to be a market viable approach um, because people, stability and degradability are inherently contradictory to each other. You can, you know, from the, manufacturer from the consumer point of view, they make it because they want to use the materials. They don't want it to degrade during the usage. But on the other end, at the end of uh, usage life, it has to go back to its monomer form. So it turned out to be a very interesting process. And this is, again, goes into how we're going to catalyze a reaction under a solid state. So typically, if you um, treat it as a two stage, so you form this in the media and by the substrate diffusion in and the diffusion out uh, to reach this intermediate uh, equilibrium, and then the reaction proceed forward. And if you look into the overall rate, it depends on the diffusion rate, the K in, K out, as well as the reaction rate. So what do you see is that if the diffusion rate is really slow, then the reaction rate is become a diffusion limited and then it's really um, how you can get that substrate into the um, enzyme mouse uh, to initiate the reaction. And so this is give us a possibility to kinetic and modulate the system. On the other end, you have to think about thermodynamics. What are the driving force for the depolymerization? Depolymerization is entropically favorable. So there's a lot of entropy gain um, for the overall reaction. And then in polymers, there's additional entropy contribution besides just going from polymer to a small molecule because there's also entropy associated polymer chain conformation. So if you have a polymer that is highly aligned in the crystalline domain, when it becomes a small molecule, you, you are going to gain additional entropies. So very counterintuitive, um, rather than from a amorphous polymer to degrade, you actually have a more entropy gain if the polymer is in the crystalline state. So um, this really help us to guide and uh, provide uh, several approaches. And one is we're basically using a polymer chain mobility, look at a polymer diffusion. And then that is really follows the DLC. The DLC tells us when the polymer should start to melt. And this is, the, you know, we get pretty lucky that help us to open up a window that the degradation rate become really high around 40 to 50 degrees that happen to be the temperature in the industry composting facility. And what is also uh, important is that as the polymers start to melt, um, you have a very little entropy driving force. And even though the polymer chain has mobility, it really doesn't degrade. This is, it, it, this is a really good news. It was not by design because you don't want a polymer to degrade during the melt processing uh, in the extruder. The other is uh, start to look into um, if we can do a post thermal treatment in order to regulate when the polymer chain is going to degrade. Post treatment is a normal process for polymer, um, any plastic to be uh, produced. And then for those of you who are uh, you know, familiar with uh, polymer crystallization, um, polymer um, melting temperature always depends on when you crystallize it. So there is uh, this inherent uh, um, connection between the TC and TM. And then you can go with Combs Gibbs equation to look at uh, uh, how that trace back to the structure. So basically what it says is it increased the crystallization temperature, the lamella signals get increased and it's going to take polymer, it's going to take enzyme a lot of more effort to drag that polymer chain out of the crystalline domain. So you can also uh, really control the um, degradation rate or degradation latency by the post-thermal treatment. So here is a one example. Um, 
we have one piece of sample. We just did two different thermal treatment. The large sphere light, what is showing here, are crystallized at a higher temperature, while the smaller sphere light would crystallize at a lower temperature. So you can see in one sample, by simply modulating the thermal uh, history, we can get material this region, small sphere light, to um, degrade very rapidly, while we can maintain the other part not to degrade. This is really provide a guideline for how the polymer should process and then so to program uh, the degradability. So um, the other process is, remember we put this little wrapper um, outside of the enzyme. We can also use that to cap the active site of the enzyme to make it available, not available. So remember the wrapper is UV degradable. So by modulating um, how the wrapper interact with active site, we can also have additional control to make the um, active site uh, to be available under a certain um, component. So let me just uh, walk you through here. This is a, really goes back to the design of the wrapper. One is going to um, cover the active site. One is going to make the active available. But nevertheless, in this case, we particularly looking to the PLA and ProteaSK combination. And basically by screening different wrappers, we can get uh, a PLA to be either not degrade or have it degrade fairly rapidly. All right, so um, that is, I would say, in the very um, early stage of our journey, trying to um, really using basic science to support, hopefully it's going to um, get into the market. I want to see it in every grocery store um, in um, every time when we have a, in every you know, package um, that is possible. And then hopefully we're going to change, you know, start to see all this plastic float, uh, flying around. But it is, I have to um, draw your attention to the market distribution of different plastics. Biodegradable plastic right now is a little bit over $3 billion, while the whole market is well over $500 billion market. So plastic market is not dominated by the biodegradable plastic. There's still a lot, majority of them are dominated by the polyolefin type. And the question um, we were asking is that how this um, bio um, process can potentially also help the polyolefin uh, business. We didn't want to look into degradation in the beginning because we think there is a reason why biology doesn't really degrade polyolefins. And as we look more into it, we understand it's a way to protect ourselves because the CC bond, the CH bond as just so routinely exist in our body. And I, I'm it, it was really satisfying to learn why you know they are not really degrading that fast. But on the other end, it really taught us some um, ways to potentially how to engineering um, programmable catalyst um, that allow us to um, modulate the process to have on and off uh, to really um, get the best word of two means that we can um, functionalize or control the fate of polyolefin, um, especially those piled up at the waste, as well as uh, trying to avoid any potential harm uh, done to our uh, ecology and our environment. So let me, um, this is a sort of a, a just a propaganda a slide, uh, really tells you why a polyolefin is so abundant. One is it really related to the readiness of petroleum chemistry petroleum uh, industry, uh, you see those monomers, they are very easily produced and they can just convert them into polyolefin. From the polymer chemistry point of view, um, it's very easy to polymerize them because you form the CC bond and the, you know, the reaction is exothermal and that you can stabilize the, the entropy you lost during the polymerization. So the CC bond is so much more stable than the ester bond I just mentioned it to you. Um, so, you know, there's a, a lot of effort and I wanted to highlight two particular area in the uh, 
College of Chemistry. One is our newest hire, Bruce Abel, and he is looking at uh, catalyst design to generate new class materials and really tailoring the ceiling temperature. So by engineering the catalyst to have a polymer um, that can be depolymerized um, under fairly mild condition is a great way to go. And also, you know, John Harwick as well as Phil Messersmith are working on uh, the, the CH bond modification to deal with, uh, to functionalize the polyolefins. So we uh, did a little bit exploration in the area. And the first thing I can tell you, share with the public is that we went through all the literatures that people claim they can, um, uh, having worms or having microbes, having, um, uh, different organism to eat plastic. Um, and also we saw literatures, people were able to embed enzymes and to see plastic oxidation. Um, we were not able to reproduce the enzyme aspect. I think the microbes are possible, um, but the process oftentimes is really complicated. And a, in some cases it involved the energy uphill in order to go into a downhill. And what we did is we tried to figure out why um, it, it cannot be oxidized or it cannot be modified. So we just embedded the peroxidase, several different variety of peroxidase people claim in the, in the literature. And what we see is that the good news is that many of them are remain active inside of the plastic. They can generate active radicals um, and they can um, basically uh, function you know, react with uh, small molecule substrates, no problem on that front. But from the, um, we modulate if this radical can access the substrate. And we basically, all the results showing that the radical can be generated, but eventually they just decay. They don't really access to the substrate. And I think uh, there are works that perhaps need to be done in the future, trying to see how can we um, interface the enzyme with the polyolefin substrate in a way that, again, we can deactivate it when we need it so that it's only, only um, going to be function when it comes down to um, polyolefin when you want to get it done versus work on your um, any of your amino acid in the body, for example. All right, so uh, I think my time is up. I have to uh, acknowledge all the people who work uh, in, in this project. Uh, what I tell you today, and you know, it's mainly a PhD thesis, a Chris Dowry. And um, we have another uh, very inspiring young gentleman, uh, Aaron Hall, who actually funded the entropic material and trying to look into um, how to make this technology into our daily life. And I cannot thank enough of many, many undergrad who work with us um, over the years. And I will say without them, we won't be where we are. And the last thing is I want to thank you for your attention and happy to answer questions. Ting, there's uh, one question coming in now, uh, which is what is the organism with the degrading enzyme catalyst in the soil compost and how prevalent is the organism in the environment? So uh, it's a good question. And that's the whole reason why we are doing what we are doing. So um, biodegradable material is going to degrade on the premise that uh, the enzymes are available. And in, when you have this in the uh, water, in dirt, in air, many of them are just not available and or they're not available at the right concentration at the right time as right variety. And you know, um, to a lot of organisms cannot really process polymer chain. They can deal with small molecules, but when they become a, a long polymer chain, they really, they, they have to convert it into a form that they can deal with. So this is a part of the reason why uh, we are, uh, you know, we basically carry the enzyme wherever the plastic goes. So it doesn't matter where you go, if it's available, it's all carried inside. So, the whole technology is based on to use enzyme as additive and then trigger it, make it program it such that uh, you can get it to be active whenever you need it. Mm -hmm. And I think with nanoscopic embedding, we also wanna make sure the enzyme does not leach out. 
And here's a question. Did you study how the enzymes uh, affect the mineralization rate or were you mostly focused on breakdown to the monomers so that it could be repolymerized? Uh, for this particular project, we mainly are working on how to um, control the degradation of the plastic. Um, enzyme, there's a, so the work is not limited just to degrade the plastic. What, do you, what we look at is really biocatalysis in solid state. So if I change to di different enzyme, if I change to a different substrate, there's, uh, you know, I can look into oxidation, I can do reduction. So there are many other variety of chemistry coming out. I would say this is only just the very beginning. Um, we have a, a, a very thankful uh, student, uh, undergraduate student from the Seoul National University, um, uh, who thanked you very much and wondered, uh, I wonder the chemical structure size of degradation res res residue. May I, may I consider it as a monomer-like level and would it be capable to restore the residue and recycle them? Yes, so if you look into LCMS, uh, we basically get a monomer, dimer, and trimer and we actually polymerize them and they made it into polymer and we can redegrade it, yeah. And we also um, look at, we actually incubate the degradation byproduct with the cells and they do, they act as a food for them. Hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, sorry, Martha uh, in the, our computation facility, they also did analysis on the toxicity. So they did a computation study to make sure that it really doesn't have anything that can you know, pop up as alarm. And that the result was very satisfying. That's great. And how, how has your work been able to address the degradation of PLA in seawater? So this is a part I think we need to look into. This is, I sort of alluded to that a little bit, um, that the wrapper is UV degradable, because when you have it in the seawater, you need to tailor it, because the temperature is not going to get into 40, 60 degrees, right? And then also um, when it's going to be triggered. And in the sea, there's abundant of... Uh, uh, metal ions and there's a pH, there's also plenty of sunlight. So that is something ongoing. Again, I, I'll, I'll limit it to two more questions. One uh, a little more technical and then uh, another uh, less so. Uh, how much more quickly do enzyme treated bioplastics break down in CO2 or break down to CO2 compared to the bioplastics uh, without enzyme? Biodegradation standards may require greater than 90% conversion to CO2 within a certain time frame. Uh, so a good question. We, we actually look into that. We're dealing with um, people who do a technical analysis um, to really look at the viability and they look into the carbon um, uh, cycles. Um, so um, for us, a degrade into monomer within a few weeks under the condition. We can make that shorter or longer based on how we program it. And uh, once it get into small molecule, let's say you get into a lactic acid, like lactic acid it just, it's a normal process. We're not changing that process. Mm -hmm. And the lactic acid will be converted into CO2 and water. Uh, we're trying to get people to do some testing. Um, the analysis shows that it, it should be uh, within six months, we should be able to get 60 to 75% converting to CO2. Uh, that is just if we let the small molecule to be um, in, the, in the compost facility. But you know, we'll see how the infrastructure worked out. The ideal case will be to um, recycle them. Oh, the other thing is I probably should brag about it is uh, they don't need to degrade in compost. We can degrade them in, at home, just use warm water because the enzyme is inside. So you should just get home, get a kettle and get a water, maybe like 40 to 50 degrees and you're going to see the plastic disappear. So in that case, there may be some you know, we'll see how the policymaker goes. There may be some potential incentives for people to recycle those monomers coming back. That's great. And I know we're all curious about translation into new technologies. Uh, so this question was, uh, and coming from, of course, our chemical engineering side. So are you close to the chemical engineering phase, i.e. big processing of plastics? 
uh, or are we still in kind of the test tube phase of, the, of this kind of research and innovations? So a couple of things. If you look into my talk, you see we did a mild extrusion for one of the materials. Um, and we are able to get, so I only had a single extruder. Um, I was hoping to get uh, a double extruder, a, a twin extruder, so that I can get in blowing to film all the stuff. Um, the good news, two days ago, I just got Europe from Department of Defense. So we get a micro extruder with film blowing, and I think that will help us to work out the, the little bit of kinks. Actually, I wouldn't call it kinks. I think it's more in the formulation phase to really make it ready for people to start to look into kilograms or a a tens of a kilograms of skills to blow films. You know, I, I've been studying polymer for 20 something years since I was, since I was 18. So, um, you know, when I was undergrad, we have to learn a lot of a polymer engineering. It, it's not like back then there's no nanoscience. So um, it's, it's interesting to go back to your know, root and then look into the, you know, chemical engineering aspect of it. Good question. <laughs> we can't wait to do it, so. Well, with young children myself, I know we're all very excited about, uh, you know, the, the potential solutions to our plastic uh, challenges that might come out of your research. So I want to thank you, uh, Professor Zhu, for your talk today. And thank you to all those that joined us live for today's talk. We hope you'll join us in the spring for uh, future Berkeley ecosystem events. Uh, this will conclude kind of our fall series. Uh, as a quick reminder, we'll uh, please take two minutes to complete our survey. Uh, let us know feedback on today's discussion, but also uh, ideas for future programming. And of course, we hope you'll join us again. And until then, as we say in Berkeley, go Bears. Go Bears. Thank you. Thank you.